So uh, in this lecture we have to see the other way of communicating. The first two lectures, the first two technical lectures we had after the introduction were about wired communications using cables, using optical fiber. In this lecture we have to see the other side of the story, so uh, how to make wireless communications with no particular media required to guide our waves from the transmitter to the receiver. So we, uh, we are going to need antennas on both sides of our link uh, to transform the guided, radi uh, the guided waves into unguided radiation. And we also have to see a little bit about the propagation of electromagnetic waves though this final uh, we cannot go here much into details because we don't have time with this course just to define the the items we are going to talk about so uh, antennas can be for any frequency range say i'm talking here for the very broad radio range i'm talking also about optical devices and we are also going to make comparison radio versus optics in ev just every part of this lecture here. So, what can do we actually need to make communications? These are antennas. And how do these waves propagate in free space, a space that is not collaborating to with our communication, so it's not giving us any uh, any help to make communication better. Uh, before discussing all these items, uh, we have to understand that uh, antennas and propagation uh, deals with three-dimensional space. With three-dimensional space it's very difficult to make calculations with scalar quantities only. We'll have uh, uh, to deal with vector quantities, we'll have to deal with effects in 3D space. So the first thing we have to define, we have to define the quantities we are going to talk about. So uh, in three dimensions we need a three-dimensional coordinate system. The usual three-dimensional coordinate system is the Cartesian coordinate system that has the three dimensions are three axes, x, y and z, uh, orthogonal uh, and right-handed. What does that mean? I will talk about that later. So, uh, in the Cartesian coordinate system, all coordinates have straight lines, uh, straight coordinate axes, uh, and uh, all the three coordinates are expressed in meters or another unit of length. Could be also feet, could be miles here, could be kilometers, but meters is for our, us most convenient, and all three coordinates can go from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, what does it mean that the three dimensions means that I have three coordinates? I can define also three coordinates with unit vectors pointing in the direction of the three coordinates. So this uh, symbol one with the vector sign is a unit vector, one means a unit vector, and uh, x means that this vector is in the direction of the x-axis. Uh, an orthogonal coordinate system has all three unit vectors uh, along their coordinates orthogonal between them. So one x is orthogonal to one y, is orthogonal to one z, and one z is also orthogonal to one x. Uh, it is much easier to do calculations if unit vectors are orthogonal. If we didn't have an orthogonal coordinate system, just calculations become more complicated. So uh, it's no real advantage not to use an orthogonal coordinate system. There is yet uh, another issue, and when we are uh, we are, when we are dealing with rotation problems, uh, we also have a right rotation and left rotation. So it's, it's convenient to define our uh, also the sense of our coordinate system. For instance, I define here a right-handed coordinate system. So one, uh, one x uh, cross product, one y, is one z, and not vice versa. If in the cross products I uh, exchange the two vectors, the sign of the cross product changes. So uh, with this uh, cross product, uh, with this vector product, I define the sense, uh, the handiness of my coordinate system. So I will also uh, 
assume that this is defined right from the beginning. So I'm not going to discuss handiness any any more in any occasion in this uh, in this discussion. What is special about coordinate system is that the Cartesian coordinate system is very good for many applications. Uh, anything you do on a computer, usually you deal with Cartesian coordinates. But for radiation problems, say antennas radiate uh, radiation, uh, a much better solution is a spherical coordinate system. And here I define the spherical coordinate system with three coordinates, R, theta and phi, where R is the distance from the origin in meters, so R, R is always positive, is never negative. Uh, can go up to infinity, but it's always positive, R in meters. The other two uh, coordinates are angles. Uh, I prefer to use the polar angle measured from the North Pole to our position vector R, with the vector sign, uh, uh, in place of latitude. Latitude would be from the equator plane to the polar vector. So, uh, let, uh, uh, pi half minus latitude is simply theta. So, this polar distance theta is a substitute for latitude. Could be also made the other way. We could also use latitude, but uh, most textbooks on mathematics use this polar angle theta. And uh, phi is the longitude, the longitude uh, so measured in the equatorial plane, the longitude from the reference uh, meridian uh, up to the actual meridian, uh, actual, uh, up to the actual longitude of our position we are in there. Of course, uh, the longitude can go from 0 to 2 pi, one whole circle along the longitude, while the polar distance can go from 0 on the North Pole down to pi half on the equator and down to pi on the South Pole. Uh, what we are go also going to need, we are going to need conversions from the uh, uh, spherical coordinates to Cartesian coordinates. Uh, how can I get Cartesian coordinates from spherical coordinates? And vice versa, how do I get uh, uh, spherical coordinates from Cartesian coordinates? Uh, so these conversions are pretty simple for the coordinates of their own. They are a little bit more tricky for the unit vectors, but we, on some occasions we will also need these conversions from unit vectors from one coordinate system to another coordinate system and vice versa. What we should also notice here is that uh, uh, in the spherical coordinates, uh, theta, the polar uh, angle, the sine of theta is always positive. This is important because we frequently we have to make the opposite uh, calculation in the opposite direction and sine theta when we, we calculate it from a square root we always take the plus sign on that square root uh, uh, to be correct if, if I need sine theta in some occasion. Uh, what is undefined, in not where we will define in the spherical coordinate system, is the longitude. The longi longitude is arcus tangent of y over x, but what is the quadrant? Uh, here on many computers I have arc, arc tangent to the function, arc tangent to that also solves this problem of the quadrant, but takes two arguments, y and x, not just the ratio here. Because if I only take the ratio, the quadrant is still undefined. Uh, this arc tan is only defined over two quadrants. The other two quadrants are still arbitrary, and that's the reason why I need the function arc, tan arc tangent of two. So this is about our notations, what we are going to deal about. Uh, next thing is the physics we have to look in the next uh, slide. So the physics, the Maxwell equations. Uh, I am going to deal with radiation and uh, radiation is strictly related to relativity, to special relativity. So uh, without relativity I only have uh, electrostatic equations, so I only have uh, the scalar potential, uh, the electric field and the electric displacement field and the charge density. This is all what I have, all I have in uh, 
uh, in a still system, no, no movement, uh, in an electrostatic system. As soon as I get to magnetic quantities, magnetic quantities, the uh, magnetic uh, flux density and magnetic field intensity, they really do not exist. They are, uh, we invented these quantities just to get around the special relativity. We don't want to deal with the special relativity. Uh, so, where, when does uh, here the special relativity really bite? The special relativity bites, uh, special relativity bites when you have linear motion. Linear, not accelerated motion. If I have not accelerated motion, linear motion of, uh, linear uniform motion of charges, uh, I get magnetic quantities. I get the magnetic quantities. With these magnetic quantities, I simply describe the, uh, the effects of special relativity. Uh, special relativity, of course, deals with distances, and uh, by having the Maxwell equations written in differential form, I can get rid of the distance. I can uh, write things in a differentially small chunk of volume, chunk of space. So, uh, the yet and the other consequence of relativity is radiation. When radiation happens, radiation happens when I have accelerated ch charges. When I have an accelerated motion of charges, then I also get radiation. And most uh, textbooks on electrical engineering prefer not to deal with radi radiation. Physicists uh, talk about radiation immediately, but uh, electrical engineering books frequently forget about this radiation. And for antennas, radiation is essential. So we badly need radiation to, for our antennas to work, and we shall look at that into detail. Of course, to deal with radiation, I have to uh, write my equations in differential form, the Ampere law, the Faraday law, and the Gauss law, using this differential operator Nabla, which contains derivatives. This is a symbolic vector containing derivatives. Since I'm going to use uh, deal with harmonic uh, time harmonic uh, dependent quantities, all the quantities will be time harmonic dependent, uh, I can replace the time derivatives with the much simpler symbol J omega. J omega is just the derivative in uh, phase or notation uh, in time harmonic uh, problems. Now, uh, these are our equations, and these equations should be really able to solve, Maxwell equations should, should really be able to solve everything. Uh, they are not, because they are difficult to solve. First, there are many variables taking part here. Uh, you see, all these variables take part in the three uh, Maxwell equations and three. Uh, the first two are vector equations, the last one is a scalar equation. So these are really seven scalar equations here. Three scalar equations for this vector, and three scalar equations here, and one scalar equation here. So to simplify things, it's, uh, it makes sense to introduce matter. Matter uh, make uh, uh, the relationship between the electric field and the electric displacement. This is the, elec the dielectric constant, the, uh, the permittivity, uh, makes the connection between the magnetic field intensity and the magnetic flux density with permeability, mu, mu here, and makes the connection between the electric field and the conductive current density with gamma, gamma is uh, conductivity here of the medium. So this uh, could reduce the number of variables I'm dealing with. So I can eliminate these three by just these three if I know the matter, which matter I'm in. Also free space, also free space has some constant here, constants here. But I'm not dealing now, don't want to introduce matter here. But uh, still the equations are difficult to solve. If I have, say, sources of radiation, like conductive current and electric charge and density, if I uh, plug these two in the Maxwell equations and I try to calculate the fields, I get very difficult equations. I can get, get wave equations for the, for the fields, but they are difficult to solve. So uh, some intermediate variables here are required. And the intermediate variables are the scalar potential, and this is usually well known from the electrostatic theory. Uh, the vector potential it is less known. Maybe some, some people learn this vector potential in magnetic theory, and even de de uh, there they are not complete. We have to deal with time harmonic problems 
with at distances where relativity bites. Where relativity bites, we have to consider exact equations only. So, uh, uh, how do I calculate uh, the fields from the potentials? Uh, I have the equation for the electric field and for the magnetic field. This magnetic field is really the definition of uh, the vector potential. And the scalar potential plays an additional role in the electric field, but the electric field is also dependent on the vector potential. So if I had equations to calculate potentials from sources, from J and uh, uh, rho, from this, these are two are sources, uh, source field, uh, sources of field in my problem. How do I calculate the fields? First, I calculate the potentials. Uh, and then I calculate the fields. Now, uh, the interesting thing is here that it is possible to obtain relatively simple equations for the potentials. Uh, the potentials take the form of wave equations, so I have uh, the Laplacian operator here. Laplacian operator operating on a vector, Laplacian operator operating on a scalar. Laplacian operator is uh, this derivative here. Of course, on a vector, it becomes quite complex, this thing. Expe except in Cartesian coordinates, it's spherical coordinates. This Laplacian is very complex. And uh, I, uh, in order to make this uh, equation simple and not to have them linked to uncouple these equations, I use the Lorentz gouge. The Lorentz gouge is used to define also the uh, divergence of the uh, vector potential because uh, this definition here is only talking about the curl of the uh, vector field. The divergence, divergence is a completely independent uh, property and when I choose the divergence here uh, with the Lorentz gouge, the, the equations uncouple. They are no longer coupled so I can calculate separately the vector potential and separately the scalar potentials. What is interesting in these equations, okay, first some simplification, I introduce this k, this is the wave number, uh, it's a constant here, is a constant comes out from all physical contents, from the frequency, omega, uh, from the uh, ang the angular frequency omega, uh, fr it comes from the uh, permittivity and permeability and all this is contained in the wave number and this is a convenient way to, because we are going to frequently use this wave number, these quantities, this quantity, it's related to the wavelength, it's 2 pi over the wavelength, so 2 pi radians over length, uh, wavelength in meters, so its units of k are radians over meter. And it's a very convenient unit to represent our equations. So not to having to write so many constants here, just this k squared. Also mathematicians like this, they like a square constant here to solve this equation. And in fact, these equations have a quite uh, simple solution and a stable solution does not uh, really, the solution does not really use derivatives. So uh, there may be singularities in the current uh, or in the charges. But these singularities are eaten up in the formulas for re the retarded potentials. So the re these retarded potentials are really a solution <coughs> of the a solution of the wave equations using the Lorentz gouge, decoupling them with the Lorentz gouge. So I get the vector potential and the scalar potentials at coordinates where I observe. I want to calculate the fields. So these are coordinates R. And R prime are the coordinates of the field sources or the potential sources. So the current of R prime, the uh, scalar, uh, oh, this here should be rho, not V, should be rho. This is a mistake. Here I should write a rho here. So the electric charge density should, should be placed here in place of this V, the electric charge density. And here I'm a little bit short with letters. So should, here should be rho. And uh, this... Uh, uh, volume here is volume prime, so sorry I have the same letter for the potential and the volume, but I don't have much choice with letters. Volume prime, the volume of our sources, of our currents and of our charges, here should be rho. Uh, 
uh, it decays with the distance linearly with the distance the potential decay and there is also a time delay the time delay is minus jk times this distance this absolute value of r minus r prime or the distance between these two vectors uh, so this is about the mathematical introduction to our problem now uh, the next thing is to look at uh, some simple antennas to see how do these things work so you have, you have just a segment of wire it's relatively straightforward to get its vector potential if this segment is short compared to the wavelength and short compared to the observation distance I can just use here the formula for the retarded vector potential and that's what, all what I have to do the only uh, special thing here this wire is in the direction 1z so also vector potential always have the same direction has the same direction as the source this is 1z but 1z I should rewrite it in uh, in the with uh, unit vectors of the spherical coordinates so I should use this relationship here I had should use here. once I have the vector potential I can take the curl of the vector potential just to calculate the H field taking the curl I get this result here in this result here maybe from the fundamentals of electrical engineering you will remember that this term 1 over R squared is the Biot-Savar law the Biot-Savar law in magnetics in magnetostatics but we do not have magnetostatics we have dynamic events here and I also have a term that decays slower and this slowly decaying term is actually radiation it's proportional to frequency K contains frequency inside it has a delay of course but all the rest everything rest is just this term here is just the Biot-Savart's law frequently this equation is called the extended Biot-Savart law where the Biot-Savart law fails is that it only deals with a segment of wire and does not tell us how does this wire, where is the source of the current and when, where is the sink of the current. Of course, if I have somewhere the sink of the current, I should have charge accumulating over there, plus Q, and I should have on the other electrode, if I have a source of a current, uh, ch charge should be deplete depleted here, so I should get minus Q so uh, I really should have two electrodes to end these charges here that do not show up in these formulas but uh, these charges so show up if I just calcu calculate using here the uh, the ampere law uh, if I calculate the electric field out of the magnetic field the ampere law is always valid Maxwell equations can always be used uh, and I rewrite this with the charge taking uh, con considering the continuity and I write the expression for the electric field I see that this expression for electric field is actually these uh, ter two terms that have 1 over r to the cube and 1 over r to the cube this term are simply simply this these two terms are simply uh, the electric field of an electrostatic dipole plus Q minus Q at the distance H and this is the strength of the electrostatic dipole but of course in dynamics I have other other components I have also co uh, components that have R squared in the uh, denominator and I also have just uh, inversely R uh, just R in the denominator so this is actually the radiation term the radiation term is very small close to our device but it uh, it decays much slower than the static terms the static terms decay quickly the radiation term decays slowly and this is responsible for the radiation in the far field uh, what we see for such a device uh, in uh, dynamics in dynamics we see that I do have a, a real component of the pointing vector so this is the power flux I do not have just an imaginary component so the, the electrostatic device only has imaginary components so there is no power flow this is just power oscillating around this circuit energy oscillating around this circuit while in dynamics I have, do have power flow, real power flow uh, and if I calculate this I can calculate the power flow 
just considering the two radiation terms. All the other terms cancel out. But the radiation term take account in the power flow and the power flow decreases with R squared. So this power flow actually if I uh, draw a sphere around my device here, this power flow is actually constant. The power just spreads out, just propagates in, in free space. But it is not lost, this power. This power is not lost. So what about the equivalent circuit of this device here? The equivalent circuit, of course, has some inductivity of the wire. It has some capacitance between the two electrodes. But there should be yet another component. So this real pointing vector gives us real power uh, flying away from our device. So this real power needs here a radiation resistance. This radiation resistor is not a resistor, an ohmic resistor that uh, uh, produces heat. This uh, resistor is just to describe this power that is flowing away from our device. And this is actually the radiation. Uh, this radiation is very, very small. The radiation resistor is very, very small. Uh, the best thing we can do with uh, considering these limitations here, that uh, this dipole is much smaller and the wavelength and the distance, the best thing we can do is milliohms here. Milliohms means very, very small uh, radiation resistance, very little radiation for such an inefficient antenna that's much smaller than wavelength. That was a problem for Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla optimized this device to the limits. He was considered the best wizard of the West, but unfortunately he was not very good at doing radio communication because he did very little radiation here. Uh, we ha uh, even have a dual, dual counterpart to the small electric dipole. It's a small magnetic dipole. A small magnetic dipole is the loop. It's a little bit tricky to calculate the vector potential of the loop. But uh, out of the vector potential is very easy to get the electric field. Why? Because there are no charges here. So this loop, this wire, uh, loop of wire ending up to the generator uh, deals with the constant current flowing around this loop. So there are no charges, and there are no sources of the currents, there are no sinks of the currents. So there are no charges. And this uh, gradient of uh, the scalar potential is equal to zero because V is equal to zero because there are no charges. So it's very easy to get the electric field and the electric field has a radiation term. Uh, we can also, taking the curl of the vector potential, we can take uh, get the magnetic field. The magnetic field is uh, with this uh, r to the cube in the numerator. These two terms are the static magnetic dipole. We don't have static here. We also have radiation. The radiation is proportional to the frequency or even to the square of the frequency. And uh, radiation is what makes the difference here. These terms are very small, close to the loop, but at large distances, these terms will prevail. So uh, the st uh, also the small magnetic dipole has a real part of the pointing vector uh, coming out, radiating out of my loop. And also this decays with the R squared. So this is actually propagation of our radio wave but no power loss. This power actually flows out of our device into the free space. So the equivalent circuit, this loop is uh, has an inductivity here and has some radiation resistors to compensate for this uh, to compensate for this uh, power escaping our system. Here. Uh, but this was, is usually also neglected, uh, they're, they're neglected in many textbooks on electrical engineering because radiation is something difficult to deal with. They just radiate, uh, they just uh, deal with the static terms with one R minus three. In fact, the static terms can be useful in some occasions. Can be useful, uh, like uh, uh, making antennas with loops. Uh, loop antennas which were much more successful. Why they were successful? Because uh, many much interference in radio communication is caused by uh, much interference is caused by uh, the electric field component, and the loops have a relatively small electric field. Uh, in the close proximity of the antenna is the magnetic field that's strong. These terms one over r to the cube 
uh, become very large close to the loop. So close to the loop it's mainly magnetic field and that's the reason why these antennas had some success though they are very inefficient if you calculate the radiation resistors and the radiation resistors multiplied by the square of the number of turns if I have or square of the number of turns and permeability of a ferrite core this radiation resistance still uh, stays very very small uh, this is micro ohms here, but it is useful in some occasions. Where are these antennas useful except for uh, long distance communication? This is all written for long distance communication, where we deal with radio communication. We could also do something in the near field, in the near re reactive field of the, such an antenna. And in the near reactive field, this magnetic loop is useful for magnetic coupling, say RFID tags or bank cards uh, actually use this field so that you have to approach your bank card to the reader to be able to, to, to read and write data on the bank card. Uh, no matter how powerful transmitter someone has, he cannot read your bank card at a distance. So that's also a sort of protection in the bank cards using just this formula here, using just these terms r to the cube down here, because radiation from a bank card is very, very small. The bank card is simply a loop inside the card with many turns. So this is about uh, simple antennas, a short uh, electrical antenna, a short, a small magnetic antenna, but uh, they are not particularly efficient. So we'll have to find better solutions to do these things. Now, uh, let's turn our attention to the radiation term only, the one with R squared. The one with R squared, what does that mean? It means that we, if we have a problem that deals only with radiation, and dealing only with radiation, is, it makes sense to talk about light. So I have a light bulb, I have a reflector to direct this radiation, but still this radiation spreads out in a solid angle omega. And uh, what is the calculation of a directional transmitter here? First, the light bulb has usually has a poor efficiency, if, especially if, if it is an incandescent bulb, the efficiency is very low, less than 10% here. So of the power we supply to our transmitter, very little gets radiated. But this radiated power spreads out over a solid angle omega because this uh, transmitter is not omnidirectional. If it were omnidirectional, it was 4 pi. So for the trans, uh, this uh, reflector D, the, this uh, uh, converging uh, reflector here, D I have, uh, actually decreases the solid angle of radiation of my device, and therefore I can get here more power, uh, a much uh, higher pointing vector here at uh, the point of observation at the distance R. Uh, I can make si quite simple calculations here, forgetting all the Maxwell equations, forgetting, uh, just taking in it into account radiation. So our directivity is just 4 pi divided by omega. Directivity is the factor by which the pointing vector increases here. Because the radiation is spread over a smaller angle omega than 4 pi, I can just multiply this with, with the directivity. So the directivity tells me how m much better is my reflector than the case of an omnidirection of a light bulb with no reflector at all. And I cannot get here a parallel ray, I can only get here a, a, a cone, cone of radiation spreading out with R squared. This uh, surface over which the uh, radiation spreads is omega times R squared the distance. So this exactly defi describes the radiation. Uh, so now I'm able to calculate the power density here at the point of observation from data from my device. So the efficiency of the light bulb and the directivity of the reflector. Uh, usually it makes sense to combine the two into uh, uh, this number gain. Uh, gain is simply efficiency times directivity. And this is with antennas, this is called gain. And uh, on many occasions we use decibels. So uh, we express uh, directivity and gain uh, expressed in decibels are 10 times logarithm to the base of 10 of D and G in linear units. These are just linear ratios with no units actually. 
uh, there. Uh, so uh, yet another data about the transmitter. If I know the power here, I can have the effective isotropic radiated power. This is a limit, usually a limit for transmitter to the transmitters to limit interference. This is directivity times radiated power or gain times power supplied to the oh my, my transmitter. This is usually a quantity when dealing with uh, dealing with uh, interference. Uh, so if I have an arbitrary radiation pattern and uh, uh, the pattern for most, most antennas is not a simple cone like here. The pattern for my antennas is uh, where, where it was here. The pattern of my antennas, if I look here, was sine of theta for the fields. Both fields have sine of theta. Both radiated fields have sine of theta. And radiated power, of course, is proportional to the square of the fields. So it's sine squared of theta. This is actually the radiation pattern. This is the amplitude radiation pattern. This is the power radiation pattern here. Uh, with antennas, we usually use the amplitude radiation pattern. In optics, we frequently use the power radiation pattern. But uh, if my function is now an arbitrary function, f of theta and phi, and with this f of theta and phi, uh, I mean amplitude radiation pattern. So to get power, I have to take the absolute value and square it. I can calculate the directivity for an arbitrary radiation pattern. I take maximum radiation, if this is along the z-axis, uh, divided by the average radiated in all directions. So average are this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, parenthesis here, this uh, uh, on both sides. So, so with this signs, I mean uh, average value here. So. Uh, here I had the pointing vector, but since I take everything at the same distance r, uh, r has to be the equal to the preselected value, value this r, large r here, then, uh, uh, then uh, I can simply cancel out this and I can just replace this uh, pointing vector s just with the power radiation pattern. So the maximum power radiation squared we divided by its average and its average means uh, calculating the average over the whole solid angle 4 pi and of course uh, in order to get the average divide this by 4 pi so I get 4 pi now in the numerator or if I use standard uh, spherical coordinates theta and phi with theta and phi I have to replace here this d omega uh, with standard angles, uh, planar angles, uh, d theta, d phi, and uh, this sine theta here is the so-called uh, scale factor or Lamé coefficient to get actually distances out of the uh, this sine theta here. So this is something we didn't have the time to do with uh, coordinate systems, but uh, this sine theta is required. Why? It's required because d, d, d theta the same. D phi, d phi, d d phi uh, means a much smaller distance at the north pole than at the equator and this is what sine theta com, uh, calculates for to get this solid angle d omega so we can get uh, the we can get the directivity also for any kind of radiation pattern for an arbitrary radiation pattern we have here now uh, the next thing we still have to deal with uh, uh, we still have to deal here with uh, uh, radiation is that even now I have different possible devices for transmission and for reception so the most uh, obvious device is to have a transmitter with uh, a coherent transmitting antenna so means that the phases of any single, the relative phases of any single elements of this array are defined. Uh, the phases are defined, for instance, if I have a reflector here. A reflector precisely defines the phase of any points it is radiating. Uh, on the receiving side, I have antennas and each ante receiving antenna is uh, equipped with a rectifier. Uh, and uh, I sum all these DC powers from the rectifiers here on my load here. This is a non-coherent reception because uh, each antenna 
is totally the, the phase of the signal getting to each antenna, each single element of the array, is totally independent from the other. I get the same result if the phases between these two change, or between these two change. So this is called non-coherent reception. Uh, I also have other possibilities. I can make a non-coherent transmission transmitter uh, that has uh, many different generators. These generators operate in the same frequency range, but they are not synchronized between them. So the phase is totally undefined here. And this is a non-coherent transmission. And I may have also a coherent receiver. So all the receiving antennas here are first connected in parallel through carefully chosen chosen uh, uh, trans, uh, uh, wires here, carefully chosen, and uh, carefully chosen lengths of wires so that I this all these uh, sums of this signal, this signal sum in phase here, and then I may have a single rectifier here, a single receiver connected to my load. So in practical communications, we are uh, dealing with all four possibilities. Radio links usually usually use a coherent transmitting antenna and a coherent receiving antenna, so a phased array for the transmitter, a phased array of a for the receiver. This phased array may also be a, a, a converging mirror or a converging lens uh, or some other solution. But we usually use for radio transmitters and radio receivers use coherent transmission, coherent reception. Uh, in other areas, we may use some other solutions. For instance, something that always happens with radio, and we are not going to discuss this today, but we are going to have a special lecture on thermal noise. Thermal noise is a limit for radio communication. Thermal noise is, of course, a non-coherent transmitter because ev every point of a thermal uh, of black body radiation radiates with its own independent phase. So thermal noise is a non-coherent transmitter uh, for, uh, and this radiation being collected by a coherent receiver, radio receiver in radio. Uh, talking about optics, an LED, a light emitting diode, is not a thermal transmitter, but it is a non-coherent transmitter because spontaneous uh, emissions uh, account for the radiation of, the, of an LED. Uh, while uh, a laser oscillates on defined on defined one mode or some defined modes, and there the phases of the uh, transmitting area of this laser are well defined with the mode of the laser resonator. So here, physics are controlled. We also have this in optics. We have laser. We have LED. In optics, a photodiode is usually non-sensitive to the phase of the radiation falling on the different different points of the photodiode but in optics a single mode fiber only collects power for a single mode so here phases are important a single mode fiber is a very tricky receiver it's very difficult to get uh, radiated power into a single mode fiber uh, because phases here are important so i also have this e example here so uh, where are my radio link and thermal noise? This is typical for any radio communications. Infrared remote control, for my TV set, for example, has an LED as a transmitter and a photodiode for the receiver, so it's non-coherent both. And uh, power transfer, there were proposals to use radio waves for power transfers, for instance, from power stations in space. Um, Collecting solar power, transmitting us as, uh, transmitting it, uh, it as microwaves to the uh, to uh, to the ground, and having uh, rectifier antennas on the ground so that these antennas on the ground and wrong di no direction they can receive power from any direction in space. But of course, so the space transmitters should have uh, directional antennas to get the power only to our receiving station and to no one else. So this was also proposed for microwave power transfer. But the most usual occurrence will be this one here. Radio link, we have coherent receiving and transmitting antenna, though non-coherent exceptions also apply to radio communications. Non-coherent uh, transmitting antenna, non-coherent receiving antenna. Now uh, let's try to uh, make simple calculations as far as we can. So, uh, 
On the transmitting side, I have defined the directivity of the transmitter and the efficiency of the transmitter. On the receiving side, I have defined the area of my receiver and the efficiency of my receiver. These efficiencies, these are technological issues. How good is my antenna? 4 pi r squared in the denominator is the propagation in free space to a, uh, to a sphere with the radius r. Of course, uh, here in the numerator, I have the directivity of the transmitter that actually improves the link. And the larger the area of the receiver, the more power I collect in the receiver. So I have coherent transmission, coherent reception in typical radio communication. And this formula is simple. Now, if I have coherent antennas, things change. Because with coherent antennas, if I look at the previous uh, drawing here, with coherent antennas, uh, I have uh, phase is important. So if phase of a coherent antenna is important, this uh, uh, receiving antenna with a defined area will also have some directivity. On the other side of the link, the transmitting antenna fits a co it's a coherent, and if the phase is defined, I can only get directivity from the size of my antenna. The larger the antenna, the higher the directivity. So there is a relationship with coherent antenna between directivity and area. There is no re such relationship with uh, non-coherent antenna. Non-coherent antenna, the directivity and the area are two independent quantities. Coherent antenna, they are dependent, and their dependence, we'll see later on how this comes out. Uh, the directivity is simply 4 pi over uh, lambda squared times the effective area of this antenna, because the antenna itself may be larger, but it's only the effective area we're actually using. Or with the gain, uh, the gain is also, also has the efficiency inside, uh, so it's here efficiency times effective area, 4 pi over lambda squared. This is only valid for coherent antennas, but this is a typical case in uh, radio communications. This is the typical case in radio communications. So in uh, radio communications, we can also rewrite this equation using only antenna gains or using only antenna sizes. But this is only valid if we have coherent antennas on both ends of the link. Here, uh, for this formula on the receiving side, for this formula on the transmitting side. So, with all four formulas, we see that the power decays with R squared. This is typical for radiation in free space. But uh, this formula here is proportional to wavelength squared. This formula here is independent of uh, the wavelength, and this formula here is inversely proportional to lambda squared. What does that mean? At the beginning of radio communication, these communications were done at the longest possible wavelength, with long waves uh, to have the minimum possible attenuation of the link, uh, because here we have lambda in the numerator, and the larger the lambda, the better the receiving. If we do not know how to make directional antennas. Uh, very efficient directional antennas. And uh, at the beginning, say 100 years ago, at the beginning with radio communication, this formula was mainly used. This formula still applies if I have non-directional antennas. For instance, two handheld radios, a handheld transmitter and a handheld receiver. Usually I cannot afford directional antennas over there. So these two are constant and this formula applies. So a handheld radio should work better at longer wavelengths as long as I can make good, uh, uh, very efficient antennas at these longer wavelengths. Uh, if I have uh, broadcast, broadcast situation, I have a defined uh, uh, transmitting pattern, so defined directivity of the transmitter, and the defined size of the receiving antenna. So for broadcast, this formula is best used. Uh, and uh, really, broadcast here, you see, this is not dependent on the wavelength. In fact, the broadcast is done on a very wide range of different wavelengths. While if I make a point-to-point -point link with directed antennas on both sides, the only uh, issue that, uh, that applies here is the size of both antennas. This is the cost. Uh, 
So if I make a point-to-point -point length link, link, the best thing is to go to the shortest possible wavelength. So go to the microwaves here to get, make the point-to-point -point links. They have less, less uh, attenuation, less uh, propagation uh, attenuation due to uh, propagation. And uh, if I have really free space, like in uh, deep space, in deep space it's best to go, to go to lasers, to go to optics, because in optics the wavelength is even smaller, I get with smaller mirrors, I get a much higher receiving power. Uh, these two formulas here also show repre uh, repre uh, uh, reciprocity. Reciprocity, every radio link is reciprocal, but reciprocity is much easier to show with coherent antennas, because with non-coherent antennas, uh, with non-coherent antennas, it's very difficult to define this or to define this, what is really happening here. With coherent antennas, it's simple to define. And reciprocity, both uh, reciprocity, both in this equation this equation, is very easily shown. The transmitter quantities play exactly the same role as the receiving antenna quantities. So links are, radio links are reciprocal, but reciprocity is easier to see with coherent transmission and coherent reception. One final issue is where are these equations valid? Because if r squared is in the denominator of all these antennas, decreasing the distance between the two antennas, decreasing the distance, we actually get, uh, we may, might get, according to this formula, we might get a higher receiving power than the transmitting power. This, of course, makes no sense. So what is R for the far field when these formulas are valid? These formulas are only valid in the far field. And uh, this is not such an, a simple question to be answered right now. Uh, so uh, where does this formula apply? Where we are really in the conditions of the far field? We should look further on the this, this final graph here uh, we have for this hour. The final graph, so when these formulas are valid. And uh, we should look at the, a simple point source and receiving with a coherent receiver. The same also happens with the transmitter, but I don't want to make things complicated. I just take a point source for the transmitter. And the receiver, uh, receiver of a certain size D. So what happens here? The wave fronts here are spherical because they originate from a point source. And this spherical wavelength, if uh, my receiving antenna has a defined size D, may not come in phase into the plane of my antenna. At very large distances, the spherical uh, wave fronts become planar. And uh, I feed all the elements of uh, my receiving array with the same phase. But at sh distances shorter than, uh, than infinity, shorter than infinity, I get here spherical uh, wave fronts and why this point may be with the correct phase this one already has a considerable difference in the propagation distance so this difference delta L R plus delta L this difference uh, may already introduce a significant phase error how much phase error can I tolerate here phase the requirements for the phase are usually tighter than the magnitude of course if I approach this array to my point source, uh, I may already, the radiation pattern of this source may not illuminate the antenna completely. So with a non, even with a non-coherent array, I have this limit because if with my transmitter illuminates less than the whole receiving array, uh, f the freeze equation no longer applies because this area is no longer uniformly illuminated. But with coherent reception, uh, the phase condition is even tighter than the magnitude. So even if this antenna is uniformly illuminated, it may be illuminated with the wrong phase, with the phase changing across the aperture of the antenna. Uh, so now if I try to quantify this error, I uh, calculate here the loss of power in decibels. Uh, loss of power in decibels uh, uh, with the, this uh, maximum phase error I achieve here uh, at the edges of my antenna. 
and this formula is actually holds uh, perfectly true for a circular receiving antenna that makes sense that it's circular this is this formula is true for the circular for a square it would be a little bit different for a square antenna but for, for a circular aperture it makes sense so how much power if delta l here is uh, uh, lambda half so we have lambda half here uh, delta L this is already pi phase error and this is almost 4 dB of power loss so this is significant with lambda squared is minus 1 dB approximately a quarter of dB for a quarter of pi of uh, phase error and uh, uh, pi over 8 uh, th is less than uh, 0.05 dB the phase error I can see also what is the condition now for R, what is now my far field condition. My far field condition has different formulas according to different phase errors I tolerate. This was find, found, this formula was found by Lord Rayleigh, Rayleigh back in 1891 mainly for optical purposes, not for radio yet because in 1891 we were not able to actually build directional antennas for radio, not, not good direction antennas, so this was done in, with optics. And in fact, we, uh, in optics we tolerate quite large errors, so if I lose here 4 dB, this is just, just apparent on an optical picture taken by an um, optical camera. For instance, I have a, a photo camera that has a lens, an aperture of a lens of 2, demi, two millimeters, of course. Cameras may have larger lenses, but 2 millimeters is given for this example, for a practical example. So I really use, uh, I really decrease the aperture size of my camera to get better depth of field of my picture. And with half a micron of wavelength, this is visible light, I get that my depth of field is 2 meters. What does that mean? My camera is focused to infinity. The, if I focus uh, the lens of my camera to infinity, the picture will be sharp from 2 meters up to infinity. At 2 meters, I already have pi phase error. I could do a little bit better with my camera if I know this aperture, 2 meters. I would uh, rather, uh, uh, 2 millimeters, I would rather focus my camera to 2 meters. And if I focus my camera to 2 meters, I would uh, have on one side infinity with error pi. And on the other side, I would have 1 meter, 1 meter also with phase error pi. So this is actually the range of focus that is usually uh, written. Uh, uh, plotted on every lens of a camera. So when you adjust the aperture, the camera immediately tells you how wide will be your depth, uh, what will be your depth of field with the camera. So uh, just to make an example from a photographic example that's maybe simple for everyone uh, to understand what I'm talking about. But with antenna measurements, I'm much more demanding. I demand very small errors because electrical engineers are usually accurate people. M electrical engineers are much more accurate than photographers. Photographers tolerate a phase error of pi while we require a phase error of pi over 8. And 2d square of the lambda is the Rayleigh or Fraunhofer distance. It's also called Fraunhofer, not just Rayleigh, it has two names here. For antenna measurements, so they can get uh, the gain of my antenna. Uh, up to the, the precision of a fraction of decibel. Also to focus my antenna, say if I have, I have a, a mirror or less antenna that I have to focus, to focus my antenna correctly, I have to work at distances that allow such small phase errors. So this is about uh, the antennas themselves. Uh, next hour we are going to see some practical solutions. Uh, for antennas, uh, how are they made, and also uh, a short discussion about the most frequent problems of propagation, not just propagation in free space, we dealt about that in uh, this, uh, this hour, but propagations in the presence of obstacles, in the presence of the Earth's atmosphere, in the presence of ground, so we should deal about this next hour.